I'm Carson Tate. I'm a management consultant and executive coach to Fortune 500 companies and leaders. I'm the author of two books, Own It, Love It, Make It Work, and my first book, Works Simply. My work has been featured in Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, Inc., Forbes, and numerous other publications. And today on the show, we're going to talk about loss aversion, why staying committed to what no longer works is undermining your profitability and your business. We're gonna explore why employee engagement is no longer a one size fits all game and how to stay curious, courageous and collaborative to co-create the future of work. And as a bonus, I'm gonna share with you how one company is going to lose one of their top performing executives by offering them $100,000. Congratulations, you are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. You know, I met Michael casually through a friend. We were sitting and chatting and then came to that inevitable moment of, well, what do you do? And Michael told me that since the pandemic, he really had given him time to re-examine his priorities. He was taking time off, he said, and he was enjoying it. Well, you know, I sensed something wasn't right, and I leaned into that. And I said, if you don't mind me asking, Michael, you seem a little uncomfortable when you were talking about the time off. And he said, yeah, maybe. Uh, I just don't know what I want to do next. I can't be unemployed for too much longer, but I don't want to do what I did before. I replied that I loved that he had the courage to jump. But I asked him, did you jump because you'd had enough? Or did you jump because you'd done the work to know what your path was? Consider this. We're all here in this moment, a time where we're in this, quote, great recession, a great resignation, I apologize. We're in this great resignation. But the question is, is resigning the answer? Or could there be another opportunity you've never even considered? Well, stay tuned, because that's where we're going on the next two episodes. As always, we need your help in staying relevant, so please get over to wherever you tune in from, and do us a favor. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And if you write us a little review, maybe I'll read it out online. Um, If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way... In case you're curious, and I know you are, I'm Dolph Barron, and I am your host, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBarron.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. On this show and in many articles, I've spoken about how the great resignation is actually the great pause. It's that moment in time where we get to really examine what matters to you. But does that always mean walking away from your job? Well, you might be surprised. Let's find out because our guest today and for the next two shows, actually, is Carson Tate. Carson serves as a consultant and a coach to executives for Fortune 500 companies, including Deloitte, FedEx, Johnson & Johnson, Kraft, Heinz, Symphony, Wells Fargo, and many others. Her work has been featured in top-tier business media, including Bloomberg Business Week, Business Insider, CBS, Money Watch, Fast Company, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, USA Today, and Working Mother and more. Carson Tate knows that when employees thrive, businesses thrive. She's the author of two books, Work Simply and Own It, Love It, Make It Work. Carson's practical, tactical, science-backed Strategies and methodologies have enabled Fortune 500 companies to amplify team performance, engage their employees, and increase workforce productivity. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome the author of Own It, Love It, Make It Work, How to Make Any Job into a Dream Job, Carson Tate! 
and the crowd goes wild, young lady. Ah, Doug, thank you. I love that. Yes, our crowd has gone wild. I'm really excited to be with you today, and I'm really thinking the timing of our conversations really is appropriate because it's the resi great resignation is not let off, right? We're seeing New still year. millions of people resigning. Yep, another 4 million in January of 2022. Yeah. It's amazing. So before we jump into that, the question I always like to start with, particularly for us, people who are brought in to work with companies, often they say, this is the problem I want you to fix. So in the context of leadership development, what is most frustrating thing to you that seems glaringly obvious, but is ignored or dismissed? You just like, come on, can't you see this? What is it for you? It, it is what is your piece of the action? So in any situation, in an organization, you have a piece of the action. So if you come to me with that presenting problem, that, that iceberg, you know what, mm -hmm. our team is just engaged, they're not communicating well, we aren't hitting our targets. I hear that, yep. But below it is you. Mm -hmm. What is your contribution to this current state? And before we're going to address the top of the iceberg, we've got to look at where you are contributing to this and have you own it. And then we'll start to move up. So personal responsibility, personal accountability. Is and awareness. awareness. I mean, and Jeff, we've talked about this. This is about self-awareness. Are, are you seeing and perceiving yourself accurately? Good luck with that. <laughs> well. So often, I mean, you know, I, I mean, the, my, my analogy is very simple, is that a fish can't describe water. And so very often um, when they bring us in, you know, bring you in, bring I in, um, you know, and they present the problem, um, I think that sometimes it's complete ignorance. It's just that they, they don't see it. It's not because they're stupid it's not because they're ignoring it it's just like it's not even visible to them exactly so we have to shine a light on it it all Absolutely. starts with shining a light and not in any way that's punitive or no. in any way that's disrespectful it's just we're going to shine a light on this so that you can see it and then once you can see clearly then we can chart a path for it right now the interesting thing about that is for me is, you know, uh, the book title is Own It, Love It, Make It Work. The subtitle, How to Make Any Job Your Dream Job. Well, mm, I, right, I was immediately, I'm like, okay, I got to push back on this one because, you know, there are a lot of people working in jobs that are like, yeah, this is not my dream job unless the dream is a nightmare. <laughs> 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 or a horror film or you know, exactly. a terrible so, slapstick comedy, fill in the blank. So right? Tell us what you mean by that last part, how to make any job a dream job, your dream well, job. Uh, your, the point around dream job is it's defined by you. Right. So what you might think of is a dream job, I might think is a special place in hell. Mm. and vice versa. So the yes. entire premise is that you do the work, the reflection, the activities that I'm suggesting to get really clear on what does your dream job look like? And then is it possible, and we'll hold that tension of possibility, is it possible for you to co-create with your employer your dream job? Do you think, I mean, you and I talked before about this, but do you think that, you know, it takes something like the pandemic, it takes something like that for many people to even get off the treadmill, stop, pause, and be willing to ask those questions. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that's so exciting about my work right now is we have a forcing agent. And I believe mm -hmm. change doesn't happen in a vacuum. There is some kind of forcing agent. And typically mm -hmm. change happens due to discomfort. And the pandemic has created yeah. so much pain and discomfort and space for a pause for us to reflect. So mm -hmm. a lot of the busyness in our lives was forcibly stripped out. And when we have that space, we're able to look at it. So if I'm not going to the office every day, I've got space. What is it about the office, my colleagues, the work that does and does not align with what I want and need in a job? And, and more importantly, what is it in me 
that doesn't align with the job because you know your your workplace might be great the people there might be fab and maybe it's just a bloody bad fit for you right exactly. maybe it's just, it's just not the right place for you not because there's anything wrong with it but part of our psychology is in order to justify making a move we have to find something wrong as opposed to finding what's right with us you know i've often said to people you know don't divorce your partner because you hate them like you should never divorce a partner because you hate them should oh if you're going to get divorced please divorce somebody you love and they go like are you crazy and i go no love them enough to recognize this is not a fit don't wait around until you hate each other and then you have a good reason for leaving that's very different and it's the same do you, would you agree it's the same in, in a position i would absolutely agree e right. exact same thing Right. So when we talk about this piece here around getting to that point, you know, as I said, the pandemic has brought that about, but it is my belief, it is my philosophy that those moments arrive constantly. They're just, you know, globally glaringly obvious right now, um, mm -hmm. but they're also subjectively and personally obvious, and sometimes we ignore them. What was the turning point in your life, in your leadership, in your business philosophy that gave you that little slap that made you realize things had to change? Mm -hmm. So I was working in a sales role and my sales role required that I made outbound cold sales calls all day mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible. Now my vocabulary did improve because I was called lots of new names I hadn't heard before. And one day when I was driving, <laughs> yes, I, there were lots of new phrases I had not heard before. But one day I'm driving into the office. It's a cold, dreary day in February. I'm like, I don't want to go. Like, it is taking everything in me to stay in that car and not turn around. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I'm like, what? This is no way to live your life. You know, the Sunday night scaries, dreading work, you know, really not wanting to interact with your colleagues and you think your boss is a terrible person. That is a horrible way to live. And it yeah. seeps into your life. And so I was listening to the radio. And as I was listening to the radio, um, it clicked for me that, hmm, well, you have a piece of this action. What are you doing or not doing that is contributing to this situation? So go into the office, start looking around, thinking about it. That afternoon, I call, I um, was a college athlete. I call my coach. I'm like, man, I am really struggling. And he reinforces it. And he says to me, hey, Carson, do you remember when we would uh, visualize for a race that we'd lay down and run the course in your head? And part of that visualization is what are you going to do to react to the course? Can't change the hill. Can't change who you're going to have to race against. The only thing you can change is yourself. Mm. And that aha radio insight and then um, helped me reframe. So I went in. It's like, okay, this is terrible, but what are you going to do about it? How can you reframe? What are you actually selling? So I dug deep into my sales data. I looked at it. And what I was selling was not 10 by 10 conference booth space. That's what it said on the piece of paper. But what I was selling was an opportunity for women. I was predominantly, my clients were females, first time business owners. And this conference that I was selling space for was an opportunity for them to launch their business. Mm. I can get behind that. That's a purpose greater than mine. So if I can help facilitate you as a business owner, I'm all in. And then the second piece was, okay, the cold calling is pretty miserable, but mm -hmm. how can you use that to develop a skill? You don't want to do this for the rest of your life, but I believe I'm going to steal from Dan Pink to sell as human. How can this become a learning opportunity? So I marched myself down the hall and asked the best salesperson, if he would be willing to mentor me. And he was, and slowly my experience at work started to change. Mm. So is that personal accountability for your own quote, miserable, um, and then moving that into purpose, 
which I think is so important. It's a central part of the work that we do is, you know, if you if you're going to work for for pay, you are nothing more than a wage slave, and and that's not a very pleasant thing to be. Yeah. But if you're going to work even in a crappy job with a higher level of purpose, you can get yourself out of bed in the morning with a spring, right? And Absolutely. and so w- one of the things that you had talked to me about was December 26. Talk mm-hmm. to us a little bit about that because I yeah, think that that's so, a, an important yeah. piece for people who are going, am I at the edge here? Yeah. Um, so that was truly my breaking point. So it's December 26, the day after Christmas, and there was a strand of Christmas lights on the on the tree that wasn't working. So it was my job to figure it out. So I'm sitting on the floor, such a terrible task. You unscrew each of the little light bulbs, it's miserable. And I realize I need another bulb. So I go to try to stand up. Oh, I thought you were going to say I need another drink. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a given. And that had okay. not helped up to this point at all. I mean, <laughs> clearly it not helped. So I'm like, oh, got to go find one of those little tiny bulbs. I try to stand up and I can't physically get off the ground. I am wow. physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. 10 days before we had celebrated my daughter's first birthday with a cake. It was literally palatial. It was this Mm. huge, extravagant, overly expensive thing, which I now know is called working mother guilt. Mm. And in that moment on the floor, thinking about her birthday, what I realized is that I didn't have a single significant memory from her first year of life due to choices that I had made. Six weeks after she was born, I got on an airplane, I flew to Arizona, started working with our corporate clients, and I followed that rhythm on the road, driving hard, pushing for the entire first year of her life, and had nothing significant to show for it. Like, I wonder how many people got to that place during the pandemic, you know, because I talked about the since 2008, in many ways, we have lived in the hustle culture. Yes. Um, it, and and I understand it is a reaction to the Great Recession. You know, yes. people got into scarcity thinking, and they started to hustle and, and they hustled hard and moved into that fear space. And then the pandemic came along, slapped them hard and pushed them off the treadmill. And they went, Oh, I didn't even know I was doing it. Um, and that's that moment of trying to stand up on December 26, who's realizing, oh, I've missed a whole year of my kid's life. And some people are like, you know, I missed the last 20 years of my kid's lives. Yes. Right. And I think that that's part of what has brought about this great resignation. But it's my concern is uh, is the knee jerk side of it. And that's where you come back in, because your work now is about let, let's take the knee jerk out of it. And let's actually look at this in a very complaint, sort of really consider what it's all about Mm -hmm. and consider what you want. Walk, because one of the things you said is you own a piece of this, you know, you're in the miserable job. Okay. then you own a piece of this. Where does, where does somebody start? Mm -hmm. Well, the first place to start is to admit that you need to be recognized and rewarded. This is a primal fundamental human need to be seen. Right? Yeah. It's attention. We want attention. It's when we are infants, attention is primal. It's the only way we're going to survive. Yeah. So the first step is how do you need to be recognized and rewarded for your contributions at your company, at your place of work? Now, this isn't just about money. I'm talking about maybe you need affirmation. Maybe I want you, my leader, to say great job, Carson, in front of the team on the team Zoom call. Mm-hmm. It's what do you need to be affirmed and recognized is the first step. And mm-hmm. then, as I shared with you, the whole premise in the book is that it's a social contract between me, the employee, and you, the employer, which is based on social exchange theory. It's about give and take. So I'm coming with my skills and experiences. I'm giving them to you. And in return, I'm asking for something, but we've got to get clear on that ask first about reward and recognition because you can't read my mind. You are not a mind reader 
And if I don't know what I need and then ask for it, how can I ever expect to get the, the be seen in a way that resonates, that fills me up from the inside? I can't. Absolutely. And again, to push back a little bit on that one, the challenge with that is if you and I walk around the mall and we start asking people, what do you want? Most people will go, uh, right? You know, <laughs> they, they turn into Homer Simpson. They don't know uh, what they actually want. And, and that becomes a major, I mean, that's in their life in any area, right? I mean, so when you say, what do you want to work? I want more money. I want, you know, the, the, I think that the answers that we give psychologically, unless we've done the work, you and I talked about that in a previous conversation, unless we've done the work on ourselves, the answers are superficial. And I think that this is where often employers fall down because they take that superficial answer. Ex they take it and they don't ask the follow-up question. Right. And I also believe, to your point, I mean, I can't have awareness of self and my blind spots, unless you as a coach or a guide or my mentor, sponsor, boss shines a light, like gives it a different angle. So when I come to you and say, I don't feel appreciated, then, okay, we're co-creating. I'm now taking the role of the manager. Tell me more about appreciation. Just what does that feel like? Can you give me an example in your personal life? Um, do you, where do you feel it in your body? Is this an experience you've had maybe with a friend or a partner or a child? My job is to help unlock it and pull it out because then we can gain clarity. It might be, you know what? I really feel appreciated very simply with just a thank you. I just need a thank you. Great. So now what would this look like in the context of our relationship at work? Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. So again, the presumption on the other side is then that the, the boss slash coach actually knows to ask those questions. And I know that you lay that out in the book and that's why the book is important because it's going to guide you, the reader, and I encourage you to get the book and read through it, but it's going to encourage you, the reader, to like have a script and, and not just to say it as a bloody script, but to, to actually embrace embody it within yourself so that you're actually having a conversation not sp spitting out lines but you're actually deeply connected to the person you're talking to and go like okay so you don't feel appreciated like tell me what is appreciation to you what does that mean to you and i'll give you an analogy right now so you can help this because you can practice this right away you don't even have to read the book but practice it right away and here's how you practice it go home and ask your spouse what makes you feel recognized, love? How do, when do you feel really like I appreciate you? There you go. Do you feel like I appreciate you? Let's try that first. And when, when, you, when do you feel really appreciated? Because here's the thing, 75%, about, it's close to, 75% of all divorces are initiated by women. I don't know if you know that, but they're initiated by women, not men, by women. So women, you know, we talk about women being more nurturing, more family oriented. No, no. Men want to stay in their relationships, but men want to stay in the relationships they're in. They don't want them to evolve. Women want to get out of their relationships because they want them to evolve. Right. So, so the, the challenge is, and when 60% of the men who were asked for a divorce, this is a survey from years ago, when they were asked for a divorce by their wife, asked, were you surprised? They said, yes. <laughs> yes, they then, were. Then their wives were asked, do you know your husband was surprised? And she says, no, I've been telling him for years. So this is the challenge. You know, so if we transfer that into the employee employer, it's, are they talking to you and you're not listening? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're the boss, are you or the manager? Are you right. not listening to the employee saying they, I'm upset with this? Or are you the, the, the other person on the other side saying, you know, I'm not happy, but I'm not telling you how, what I need. It's a two-sided thing, and I think this is so much about what your point is in this book, is let, let's, let's slap people upside the head and go, stop blaming and take right. accountability. Take accountability. You're going to outsource your professional fulfillment, engagement, and career to someone else based on assumptions and their ability to, quote, read your mind? 
Right. Absolutely not. No. And now the employer's piece of this is the openness to having a conversation that maybe you've never had before and is probably going to be uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. where I get pushed back from all of my corporate leaders is what if they ask for something I can't deliver? Yep. Well, what if, do you not negotiate with your clients and your vendors? You're great at negotiation. You do that all day long. So Let's have a conversation. Let's negotiate. If you were willing to sit with a give and take. The other piece that I get pushed back on is, well, what if I do co-create for Carson? Well, does this mean I have to do it for everybody else? Well, yes, it does. But the anchor point for you, my corporate leader, is we are aligning the co-creation of this workplace to strategic goals and objectives that drive profitability and serve your customers. That's where we align. We're not going to disconnect from the reason that you're in business. So take us a little bit deeper into that part, Carson, because that's important, I think, for the leaders listening. They're going, okay, i got to sit down with these people. i got to find out what they really want. i got to find a way to give it to them and certainly negotiate it. But I've still got to make profit. We've still got to hit the bottom line. We've still got to make sure that we're we're reading, you know, that we're reading, hitting all the metrics, all the KPIs. Absolutely. Walk us through a little bit about how to get that in alignment. Mm-hmm. So I think about it, Dove, is is the container, the container that holds our conversation. So mm-hmm. the the walls of the container are our core mission, my company's mission, how we make money and serve our customers. So that's kind of the container in which we're going to sit down. And so if I come to you and I say, I'm on your uh, call center team. So I answer the phone for our customers when they have problems with their technology. And I come to you and say, Dove, you know, I really don't want to work um, a fixed schedule. I need more autonomy. I hear that. Tell me more. What does it look like? Is something going on in your life? So now let's look at, in order to serve our customers, we have to have set times that our team is available to service them. Okay, so that's the only way we're going to make money. Now, if this job right now doesn't align with what you need, let's look at maybe there's another option, but I have to staff my call center at specific times to meet a customer need. Now we're having a conversation and I, my piece of the action as the employee could be, okay, well, I understand this is how we serve our customers. This is how we keep our maintenance contracts and make money. Maybe this isn't the right job for me. Maybe I need to develop some new skills and move to a new position in the company, or maybe I need to think about what would be a next step for me. So this is the the co-creation, but the boundary that's in place for our leaders. Yeah, I mean, and another way of that is is also as the employer um, is is when those people come to you and they make suggestions about what they want, um, maybe open your mind a little bit because they may be presenting you with what they need, but what they're actually maybe presenting with you in disguise is what you need. So for instance, using that same example, this person comes and says, I want more autonomy uh, because I don't want to be working that kind of hours anymore. I need to be at home with my family. And you say, okay, well, we got to op- we got to have the answer. Great. Well, may I make a suggestion, Mr. Boss, Mrs. Boss? Yeah, sure. Well, right now we, we provide customer service between eight and five. I'm happy to do customer service between seven and 10. Why don't we, why don't we decide to do it a little bit later? We're going to get much less calls, but I'll be available. Right. And maybe we can, maybe that becomes an add on for our company to say that we offer customer service, you know, till, till 10 o'clock at night. Which is a differentiator in the market. And what's happening here is uh, another really crucial piece. Can you be open to the possibility? I wonder what's possible. If we rethink this, and now I've challenged all of our leaders that we're working with, we are in the midst of rapid change. Now's the time. 
experiment, yep. experiment, and change. And I also believe that the people closest to the work have insights around Absolutely. there might be a better way to do it. So seven to 10, wow, that works for you. It could be that you negotiate and realize, well, you know what? I'm fine with three days mm -hmm. in this fit schedule. And fourth day, if I could do the seven to 10. And on the fifth day, what I'm really interested in doing is developing as a trainer. Right. Maybe I could look at how I could use that time to shadow and coach and maybe develop myself. Wow. Now we've got a really wonderful solution versus a binary. It's only going to be this way. It's only going to be that way. And that, that's what I love about what you're putting forward in the book is that it's not about I hate the job or this is about employee. It's about what do I want? And I is on both sides. Yes. I, I, the employee, I, the employer, what do I want? Mm -hmm. And, and am I restricting myself inside the boundaries of what I believe? Oh, my boss will never listen. That's bullshit. You don't know that. You do right? not know that. You right? do oh, not know that. They'll never, they'll never give me that. How do you know? Did you uh, ask? Well, uh, yeah. did you ask? Well, kind of, no, no, you haven't asked. No. Until you've asked, you don't know. And what's more is how you ask, yeah. right? If you came at it aggressively and demandingly, that's not going to work. But if you come at it with a way for them to think in a different way, that's a completely different mentality. And that, again, opens an expanse on both sides. So this is what's so powerful about this. We're already at the end of part one of this delicious conversation. I want to come back in part two and I want to talk about something that, you know, companies are spending billions of dollars on that's not working. And I want to find out what you think we need to be doing in order to make it work. So before we do that, and before we get into part two, I want to make sure everybody knows how to find about you, find out about your book and all of your wonderful services and all the resources that you have. Could you please tell people how to do that? Absolutely. So you can find out more about me and the work that we do with our corporate leaders at workingsimply.com. So that's our website, workingsimply.com. If you're the social type, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn, the Carson Tate. And my book is available in all of the normal book outlets. So it's on Amazon, if that's yours, or Barnes & Noble, you can find it there as well. Fabulous. And we'll, of course, make sure that all of those links are uh, published on the show notes. So if you didn't get time to write them down. Just go into the show notes. You'll find them right there. We're going to be back in one click for part two of our delicious conversation with Carson Tate. Till then, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious because it's a two-way street. Nobody has all the power anymore. Now we share that power. Now we get to co-create. We'll see you in one click for part two of this delicious conversation.